today my focus would be on RF lesioning for trigeminal neuralgia. But if you are if you are not doing it on a regular basis, in that situation, the understanding of anatomy is important, and I'll try to focus most on that. So I'll quickly skip some basic slides. Obviously, the gold standard even now is medical treatment to start off, and then we have ablative and non-ablative procedures. In non-surgical ablative procedures, the uh, head of the gang is RF ablation, though we have balloon uh, uh, compression and uh, uh, glycerol is not too often used these days. And then we have the keyhole approach for microvascular decompression. So, trigeminal neuralgia, as we know, is one of the severest form of uh, pain more common amongst females uh, and just i'll just focus on these uh, red things can i have the laser pointer please thank you so clinching a diagnosis is obviously as you understand it's clinical and you you're not going to really get anything radiology many times we see that we are missing veins on the mri or we may not be seeing the vessel but still the patient has neuralgia so obviously, uh, it's restricted to It's restricted to the fifth nerve. The trigger point may bear no anatomical relation to the site of pain, but it's on the same side. Sleep is often not affected. That's very important. So uh, the important thing is one angle of mandible. The pain will not go or should not travel below the angle of mandible. That's one. Most of the patients will tell you that my sleep is not affected. So it's more of a daytime sort of pain. So uncommon to have the sleep uh, being affected and there would be episodes of remission as well. So in medical therapy, you have carbamazepine and other drugs. We are all using them. In ablative procedures, glycerol, rhizotomy, balloon compression, percutaneous RF and radio surgery. So, alcohol has a high recurrence, shorter term relief. Balloon compression is excellent for V1 neuralgia and it is uh, quite comparable to, you know, even RF, though RF scores higher. Uh, radio surgery, gamma knife, 80% relief at one year. Uh, following failed previous procedures, this, this appears to be good. And uh, recurrence is highest for the percutaneous procedure, uh, for the uh, non-surgical procedures. Uh, so let's come on to radio frequency lesioning and these are my personal indications. So failure of medical treatment, obviously you shift to some form of uh, uh, surgical procedure. But this is very important and I respect that. Patient preference, it's extremely important. So, you know, the books would say that uh, less than 60 years of age go for an MVD or if there are a lot of comorbidities and uh, or no comorbidities go for MVD, etc, etc. But I think, you know, we need to respect what the patient wants. It is our duty to tell him uh, the whites and blacks and grays of the procedure but ultimately we should allow him to choose and we shouldn't sort of you know uh, uh, tell him what we think is the best for him because all of these procedures have failures be it MVD or RF or etc etc uh, for aged and medical comorbidities again I tend to put uh, RF as the first choice and if there is a recurrence after previous MVD. It's the best for V2, V3 neuralgia. People have also started doing uh, for V1 at a lower temperature. So now I'll try to focus on anatomy and this is what I want you to uh, sort of imbibe as well. Because if you understand the anatomy, then doing RF lesioning is a piece of cake. It's very simple, easy to perform procedure. So as we know, there we have the uh, trigeminal ganglia and then we have the three divisions and sort of here you have the foramen ovale through which the mandibular nerve is coming out and from here we enter into the gesserian ganglion. So how does the foramen ovale look like on sagittal plane? It lies in the mid pupillary line. 
okay i'll show you a few photographs of that also and it is approximately 1.5 cm lateral to the internal canthal ligament i'll explain what i'm saying here now uh, uh, again it is the level of posterior root of zygomatic arch that is again one of the landmarks but don't get confused i'll just tell you the simplest of thing now just see here you have the foramen ovale and you can imagine the orbit here so the foramen ovale on a coronal plane on a flat plane will be somewhere near the mid pupillary line okay so when you are putting the needle just see to it that you are towards the mid pupillary line the success rate would be higher now again if we look here you have the foramen ovale here again towards the mid pupillary line but other foramen you need to see as well you can injure the contents of foramen spinosum foramen lacerum and then uh, you can you may as well injure the jugular uh, and inferior orbital fissure contents so um, so it's quite important to understand that if you are grossly uh, not on trajectory then you can injure important structures in foramen ovale we have the emissary vein same the vein nerve uh, artery content uh, but generally you don't tend to injure these smaller vessels so uh, it is uh, this uh, uh, foramen ovale is almost 7 millimeters by 4 millimeters in the middle cranial fossa and anterior part of the petrous temporal but th this is a generalization uh, what my experience has been as you get more and more older patients so it might be is a uh, tentatively easier in a, a fifth decade lady versus a eighth decade male patient because i think there are a lot of skull changes still happening there are a lot of ossifications happening and the entry into the foramen ovale may become challenging that's number one number two uh, again it is not necessarily a ovale though its name is foramen ovale but it's not necessary that it will always be a oval structure at times it can be really small and you know you may struggle uh, to find where the foramen ovale is but this is sort of in most of the cases it is 7 into 4 millimeters and uh, again if if it is small in size or there are a lot of osteophytes or uh, sort of entry is difficult you can take various uh, approaches various views of your fluoroscopy to sort of negotiate the uh, ovale sorry so what you do is uh, basically how you find the canal when i say mid pupillary line so when your needle is entering the trajectory has to be towards the mid pupil that's number one so what you do is you insert a finger inside the mouth and you ask the patient to close the mouth uh, and then about uh, sort of uh, uh, three centimeters lateral to the oral angle you start your uh, entry now you're putting this needle uh, sorry your finger for two or three uh, things number one is you don't want your needle to penetrate the buccal mucosa that's number one number two you're feeling the mandible because the needle third you're also feeling the third molar maxillary third molar because the foramen ovale lies behind it so sort of your needle becomes uh, your finger becomes your eye apart from the fluoroscopy to guide you towards the uh, foramen ovale so uh, the current available techniques for cannulation you have the traditional fluoroscopic guided which i hope you would be seeing today you can also do a uh, ct guided cannulation and neuro navigation guided cannulation is also possible but then it's like taking it a little too high uh, so coming to ideal trajectory uh, three centimeters lateral to angle of mouth why we have decided on this i'll come to it you direct your needle medially it is felt by the finger within the oral cavity towards the mid pupillary line and on lateral fluoroscopy 
it is almost 45 degrees to the heart palate. Junction of anterior two third and posterior one third of heart palate or a little behind. So, um, uh, I'll show you some photographs. So, let your needle, this is your first guide, the heart palate. So, when you are having a Siam look, look at the heart palate and it's going to guide you. And then you, it is almost one centimeter below the floor. Uh, electrode positioning, uh, we'll talk about it later. Uh, okay, now relation of the foramen ovale with the heart palate, what I was saying was, see this is uh, the third molar area and the needle is, and this is the heart palate. So when you see the heart palate on the lateral x-ray, the needle goes from somewhere in the posterior one third to go there. If it is going more anteriorly, you may enter through the inferior orbital fissure into the orbit. Uh, complication avoidance, early detection of the trajectory is important. Heart palate is a fixed bony landmark. It's going to help you. Provides estimate of trajectory in the early phase. So initially itself, you are guided by the heart palate. Uh, later on, the cellar floor, clivus and petrus uh, temporal area uh, would help you. Lateral fluoroscopy is important for prevention of complications secondary to misplaced needle. So this was this was a study we are still continuing. I'll skip that. Okay. Now see this photograph. Uh, you need to focus. I'll explain you each and everything. So first of all, uh, you should have a clear single anterior floor. You should have a very good view of the cella and the clivus. This is the petrous temporal. This is the heart palate. So your uh, technician should be able to show you exactly this picture for you to uh, negotiate the foramen ovale. First landmark is the heart palate and the needle has to be in the posterior part of the heart palate. The next is cella, so cella and the petrus, and it is somewhere at the junction of the clivus and the petrus, that is where you need to target your needle, and mid-pupillary line. So these three, if you have, you would be able to put in your needle uh, in almost 80% of cases without a lot of jugglery. Uh, okay, in... Uh, most of the cases what I have just shown you, you will not require a AP or a submental view. Now there are two schools of thought. Uh, one would always use a submental view uh, and the other group say I am one of them. I would try to first negotiate it only on the lateral. Agar ho jata hai it's good. Otherwise if I am struggling then I will take a submental view to give me an idea where the foramen ovale is. Uh, so, this is an important picture. Uh, so, here you have the foramen ovale with the mandibular. Just behind and medial to it, you have the internal carotid artery. But because of uh, the way the foramen lacerum and carotid canal is, it's not very easy to sort of injure it. You And because uh, your needle then starts getting into the petrous temporal and you know that you don't have to go there. So, chances of injury is remote but still it exists if you are uh, not cautious. And then still behind is the internal jugular vein. What you can really injure is uh, the middle meningeal artery in the foramen spinosum which is just nearest but then you will not have uh, uh, major bleeding because there are a lot of structures to sort of compress the bleeding. It is only rare that you will have a major bleed. Now, coming on to the x-ray, you need a good lateral view. You need a flat, flat and without a parallax uh, anterior cranial fossa, a good cellar position and you need to see the clivus and the heart palate. And this is what your trajectory has to be. Uh, I'll just show you this photograph. This is a video with a 3D. I'll just orient you. So, here we have cut the mandible. Here you see the third molar on the maxilla and this is the foramen ovale. So, we'll just try to rotate it so that you can appreciate. 
So your finger is going inside and this is the space you get to sort of enter and then this if you look up it is almost nearly to the mid pupillary line. So this is on the left side and if we rotate it uh, then you get the view on the right side. So I hope you've understood the 3D anatomy now of foramen ovale. Uh, if you want, I'll show this uh, again. Uh, right, then you should know where the location of the Gaiserian ganglion is in relation to uh, the other uh, cranial nerves. So it is abutting sort of the cavernous sinus wall and um, I haven't sort of uh, uh, injured or, or damaged the higher up nerves but somehow one of my patients suffered an abdusent nerve injury. Perhaps there was an abnormal location. So I did RF twice in this lady over a period of five years and both the times she had eye complications. Uh, but other than that, you generally don't tend to injure these nerves. What you injure is the ophthalmic nerve and uh, also you can cause corneal uh, uh, hypoesthesia. If you look internally, this is the location. So, you are entering from here. So, the lowest you are in relation to the clivus, you will be targeting the mandibular division or the V3. If as you keep on going higher, you will reach to V2 and V1. And clivus is sort of your um, point. If you are sort of proximal to the clival line, you are targeting more of V3. At the clival line, you are targeting say around V2 and as you get in, in you are targeting V1. I'll skip this. Okay, so this is the photograph I have again brought in. So, as the needles keep on going inside, you are dealing with more of the divisions. Today we have one patient who has, I think, V2, V3 and another has V1, V2. So you would be able to appreciate that as well. So 90% uh, relief immediate with a recurrence of 20% at one year is what the results are for RF ablation. So what I do is I use a 22 gauge needle, 10 centimeters of uh, 15 centimeters depending on the electrode that you have, the size of the electrode. Uh, you enter through the foramen ovale, the tip re reaches besides the ganglia. You do a test stimulation, a paresthesia in the trigeminal distribution. Uh, so, and then uh, you also check for motor stimulation. And then finally you conduct a lesioning of 60 to 80 degrees centigrade for 60 seconds. So you can do one or two. I have generally in my area, I have had much higher recurrence if I have just given one. Uh, so I tend to give two shots and my preference is 75 degrees centigrade. Why that is, uh, I'll show you that as well. So you need a RF generator, there's a fluoroscopy and you need a good anesthetist and team. Uh, a small uh, uh, support uh, in the interscapular area, there is mild extension, very limited. Oxygen is flowing, your uh, anesthetist is there with you. You position the C-arm, see that there is no parallax, the cella needs to be sharp, you need to see the clivus, you need to see the petrous temporal, you need to see the heart palate. So this is what you, uh, the area of interest is and you need to sort of focus in here. Now, uh, on lateral view, you can either place the patient like this or like this. Uh, but it sort of doesn't matter till you see all your bony landmarks clearly. Uh, so I was talking about the lateral canthal line. So you can just sort of draw and this is where you will enter or you will take 3 centimeters lateral uh, from the uh, angle of mouth. Now why 3 centimeters? Because you have the facial artery and facial vein very close to the angle of mouth. You don't want to cause a, a sort of a hematoma here. So that is why you tend to go more lateral. You just mark it 
and this 3 centimeters would almost be uh, in line with the lateral canthal line. You give a local with a needle inside, again 22 gauge 10 to 15 centimeters with a 5 millimeter active tip. Now you look at the needle here, you see this white thing, this is all insulated and you see the black thing here is the active 5 millimeter tip. So you just need a simple insulated needle. Uh, on Siam, you conduct this uh, and you angle it towards the mid pupillary line and somehow you would be able to reach it there. Okay. Now, this is the submental view, oblique submental view. So, first things first, this is the foramen ovale here. It is in mid pupillary line. This is the maxilla. It lies. So, the third molar would be here. This is the mandibular shadow. So, you just look inferior and lateral to the maxilla and you will find the foramen ovale. But I must tell you, it's not that easy. At times, you need a lot of movement of the C arm to really focus on uh, uh, to finding because there are other hypodense, hypotense shadows that you see and you tend to get confused. <coughs> Okay, so the test uh, is, test stimulation is uh, 1 millisecond pulse 0.3 to 0.5 volts. Studies say that lower the voltage on which you get the stimulation, uh, the less the temperature you can use or uh, the better results you will have. And paresthesia and the division of the stimulation sort of uh, tells you. And here when I'm giving the stimulation, th there is movement and as I increase the voltage, the patient starts, you know, moving her uh, jaws because there's, there's current traveling and there is some sort of pain. This is, I'm just talking about the test stimulation. So, uh, you uh, position the needle and on an x-ray you gradually sort of take it in and this is where you place, this is the clivus, here the CSF is sort of coming out. Almost in half of the cases, you will have the CSF coming out, but not necessarily in all cases. So, you are very sure that you are in the right place. You introduce the RF cannula and you give the current. So, uh, the, uh, the machine would show you the temperature, the impedance. Now, impedance is very important because if the impedance is between 300 to 500, you are sure that you are within the Gasserian ganglia. If the uh, impedance is high, then either you are not in the right location or there is a lot of sharing that has happened. So you may need to pull out your electrode, clean it and insert it again. This is the temperature and the time. So here you have the stimulation, continuous lesion, pulse lesion. Again, continuous lesion is what we are using. Pulse lesion is not shown to have an extra benefit. Post-procedure instructions, antibiotic for a day, carbamazepine to continue and you gradually withdraw and you can discharge the patient four hours later. Uh, complications, facial hematoma, injury to surrounding structures, meningitis, facial numbness, chewing difficulty, corneal hypoesthesia, dysesthesia and these are the percentages. So, more than 90% initial relief with good RF rhizolysis. However, there is 15 to 20% recurrence at one year and at uh, 5 and 10 years it increases to 30% and 40%. Long term results of MVD are definitely better than RF. Now, uh, these are some alternative radiographic views. Uh, this is uh, in some you have to do, uh, um, uh, so initially you have to bend your uh, C arm to 40, 45 degrees and tilt it to 20 degrees to get this view. <coughs> I will want to draw your attention to the optimal radio frequency temperature and the optimal RFT temperature to achieve long lasting pain relief with minimizing facial numbness and painful dysesthesia maybe around 75 degrees centigrade and our experience has also been similar. It gives 75 degrees centigrade is a good point at which you can target. Okay, so uh, I, I have already talked about the complications. Uh, this is just more detail about it. 
however i'll in the interest of time i'll uh i'll skip this part and yeah i think uh, i'll conclude my lecture with this thank you yes sir why not Yeah, why not? I mean, if you are, it is ultimately there is a very thin, though not very thin, our buckle wall is quite thick. Yes, but still you can sort of injure. You can puncture. You can puncture. So does that contaminate the needle? Do you have to change the needle? Yeah, you can change the needle. Okay. Yes. <laughs> but you can sort of you can change it, clean it. Okay. Yeah. Because the mid pupil line, if you think like that, it comes inside the oral cavity in that way. Your buck, your needle. Yeah. But what happens is buccal lining is coming, and it is layering. It takes a inside, turn, right? And then it Understood. it's over the gums. So before it is taking the turn, turn you are entering. And the patient position in this we will be seeing in the OT, but it is uh, patient is lying down. Yeah, lying. Supine. Supine. Unlike. Glycerol, ah. where you tend to make him sit at times. Okay, so here patient yeah, is absolutely supine. Very. Yeah. Yes, sir. So patient is supine. There is no bolster, no nothing. There is below. You know, no, just uh, you know, you push in a little bit of uh, a sheet, sheet to under the just my, uh, under the shoulders, shoulders to slightly to just extend. a little bit. But you can modulate that. What you want is a good X-ray picture. And how do you define the catheter you have put in, RF catheter or whatever it is? Mm. You saying that first point is the V3. As you go in, it will be V2. So you're deciding based on the paresthesia or you're, how do you decide where the end okay. point is? Ideally, ideally, it should be both the location as well as the patient's feedback. Okay. Um, so, if they both match, you'll have the best of results. But at times, you know, what happens is there is a miscommunication between what you want and what your anesthetist is doing because your anesthetist is making the patient sleep while you are negotiating the needle. Right. And then when you're giving the test stimulation, the patient has to again awaken. So, you mean this is done under sedation or? Yeah, sedation. So, I either use SIBO. Or I use propofol. So my anesthetist is either CO or propofol. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, very nice presentation, Dr. Ashish. I have three questions for you. Could I ask one by one or yeah, yeah. anything? Uh, yeah. First of all, uh, you told uh, there will be a 50, CSF coming out of the in 50% of cases. What I can make out uh, from this is uh, that means our tip of our needle is near the porous oculomotricus, only then we can get uh, because uh, the ganglion doesn't have CSF. Yes, so, so okay. should we withdraw the needle if CSF comes or no? No, no, no. Because uh, yeah. is the, the current won't be uh, going into uh, 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 CSF rather than going into the telling ganglion because uh, the needle is hitting only a porous. Only the tip, and CSF can come only when the tip is in the CSF. So, yeah. uh, uh, so what is happening is it's like uh, basically if you look at the ganglia, there are layers of arachnoid. So you really don't know how that arachnoid has been uh, uh, injured. Okay. Okay. So there could be a flow of CSF. So what you really need to focus is on the impedance. Okay. If the impedance is somewhere between 300 to 500, you are pretty sure that you are at the right place. That's number one. Number two is the current is like our, uh, it's like uh, elongated balloons. So the, the lesion. So it's not that the lesion is in a very small area. It's in a larger area. So sort of it will uh, affect the ganglia. Uh, second thing, uh, uh, sometimes, many times, rather than uh, sometimes, many times we get two cycles rather than one cycle. So, do we withdraw to the middle? Yes. What I do is one I give at, suppose there is V2, V3. So, one I'll give at the clavel line and the other I'll just withdraw a little bit, do a test stimulation again and then I'll give the RF. How do you do it under I do it under anesthesia. How can you withdraw and then 
simulation. Yeah, so for the next, again, the same process has to be repeated. Yeah, so basically, either we are giving uh, uh, propofol or SIVO. SIVO, the patient comes out pretty fast. But in. No, I will tell you one more important thing. Why V2 and then V3? Because we know that V3 has much more motor stimulation because the motor fibers are there. So even if I am getting a motor stimulation with little bit of propofol and SIVO, I am pretty sure that I am at the V3 area. So I go ahead. Even if the patient is not telling me that there is V3 paresthesia, I go ahead and I lesion it there. Did you give anesthesia before you stimulate? So I give anesthesia prior to stimulation, which is short. I get the patient, I push the needle in, because obviously that, that's a painful part. And then the patient sort of comes out, okay, and then I uh, do the test stimulation. But as I was just, uh, before you came, as we were men I mentioned, there, there is always some sort of miscommunication or that fluency is not there between you and the anesthetist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. If you are pushing and pulling the needle in without uh, confirming that you are in the right place and you, you raise the temperature to 80 and you inadvertently knock off the V1, it's a total disaster. So that is why, sir, V1. I will tell you what we do, what I do. Yeah. We, we put the needle under local anesthesia. We don't give any sedation. So the most painful part is, of course, when you touch the. Yeah. So it's a matter of few seconds, reassurance, everything. And there is a also, but reassurance is one. So you have to do the stimulation when the patient is fully awake because he is not able to comprehend if, if anesthesia is given. So fully awake, you have to ask whether it is mandibular, maxillary, and make sure that it is. Go, go up to 0 0.5, 0 0.6 uh, temperature, I mean, like uh, sensory stimulation. And if you are very sure, then only go ahead. Because sometimes what we have seen that you 0.5 uh, motor stimulation, I mean like 0.5 you're getting a sensory, but 0.6 you're getting even in V1, right? So obviously the the position of the camera also for a maxillary is mid, mid, uh, yeah. upper in middle and uh, mandibular is lateral. So that also will vary. You, if you're very lucky, you may get mandibular and then you push it down, you may get maxillary, but that does not happen very often. Yeah, so I'll counter this, sir. Uh, first of all, sir, for you, putting a needle and for us, putting a needle is a huge difference. You may be putting it in one go, so your, your patient may not feel that much of discomfort. When I or when we are doing, we may be doing four, four uh, uh, points where the skull is touching and that is a very painful uh, process. That's number one. And number two, sir, I am withdrawing the needle, so I am moving away from V1. So that is, if I have targeted V2, and if I am withdrawing it, how can I injure V1? No, I, that's okay, but when the patient can get SIVO or protocol, even when you withdraw, he is not able to comprehend that he is getting stimulation in maxillary or mandibular. I, I would agree, and that is why I use a little bit of motor. And you said needle in one go. See, basic, the basic success of this particular procedure is seeing the foramen. If you are able to see the foramen, it's like a tubular just going. I agree. It. So if you are not able to see the foramen, I think we should not even attempt. So okay. seeing the foramen is very Our last question. Uh, I also request Dr. Dureja to please come. He is the chairperson for today's session. So if you can just ask. Yes, sir. Uh, during stimulation, uh, uh, do we get... Uh, Anesthesia or do we get the same pain which patient was having pre-op? You can have either. Okay. You can have either. But generally, paresthesia or pain, to, so, he has to tell you something. No more questions. We have the OT. We have the OT session.